All right, thanks for staying with us. Um, silent firing, that's what we're talking about today. And let me just pull out something. Have you ever been in a situation where um, you're in an office space and all of a sudden you feel choked, Angie? Yes. Okay. All right, so quiet firing is when um, someone decides to frustrate your life. <laughs> When a manager or an employer makes an employee's job so unpleasant that they quit on their own. In the job stage uh, survey, which um, gathered data across various industries, 56% of managers said they have employees they wish they could fire. Nearly a third of managers surveyed admitted that they've quietly or, or actually quietly fired an employee using tactics like reduced workload, no promotions, no raises. Plus a quarter of managers surveyed said they are more suspicious of their employees because of the quiet quitting trend. Quiet firing can have severe consequences for employees in developing countries. Many of them are unable to find new employment, leading to financial hardship and emotional distress. So today we're asking, what does quiet firing mean for an employee? Um, remember, you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to read one eight zero three four six six three. So I'm going to bring in Vumile in like a minute. I just want to hear your thoughts. So when you said that you felt choked, right? When I asked you that, have you ever felt in, been in a place where you felt choked? <laughs> so what did you do about it? Um, for the longest time, it's not like there's so much you can do about it because. Like, like you said, the person in question is always someone who is above you, yeah? And for whatever reason, they have decided that they no longer require your services. So um, I feel like quiet firing is not always when they want to. Well, the end result is always to get you out of the office. But I feel like sometimes some bosses don't even know that, they, that that is what they're doing. They just frustrate you and either lock you out. And by locking you out, you already feel like you're out of the office. Mm. Do you understand? Because there's a level to it. If they're frustrating you within the work environment and it has to do with work, that's different. But when someone makes a purposeful effort to make you feel left out, not part of a team, not part of the organization, but still you are employed within the organization, it gets quite frustrating to the extent that you start to feel and think to yourself that if I'm not needed here, why don't they just tell me to go? But nobody ever tells anyone. Why do you to have go. to wait for them to tell you to go? No, but that's the thing. You want to have a job. Mm. You don't want to leave okay. your workplace. Let me do you understand what I, I mean. I said it doesn't seem like you're quitting. So let me yeah. talk to Vumi. Vumile is the chief executive officer of Hayseed Consulting which is a coaching and consulting firm specializing in commerce acceleration, career coaching, women empowerment, facilitation, and training on the African continent with presence in Nigeria, South Africa, Botswana, Kenya, United States of America, Rwanda, and affiliate in Namibia, Ghana, and Uganda. She has coached in multinationals such as Google, APSA, Invest, Investec um, Private Bank, Silica, FNB, Vodacom, and Anglo American. She is a friend of the house, and we're so happy, super happy to have this conversation with Vumi. Hi, Vumi. Hello, hello. How is everyone in Lagos and in Nigeria? We're good. We're, we're hoping good. you're going to come to us very soon. <laughs> Hi, Vumi. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you loudly. I said, when are you coming to Lagos? Uh, when when I'm not dealing with two small little kids <laughs> from the next year. <laughs> I can imagine. So for me, this topic is quite interesting, right? I really love the topic. Um, I would say to you that, um, in fairness, right, I am an employer. And sometimes I feel like if, 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 a, if an employee is frustrating my life, I'd just rather not, you know, because, again, it's not all employers that have the capacity to be able to just fire Right, so, so they'll just kind of like wait it out 
So I will just keep on reducing. I might reduce your workload, give it to somebody else that can deliver effectively, um, reduce the number of interactions and all of that so I don't get myself worked up. Some employers will just come out outright and say, you're fired. But some employers are not able to fire people. And I feel like those are the employers that are in this bracket of, um, what's it called, silent firing. So help me out here. Um, is this a, a correct analysis or anyone can be can become a silent uh, um, fire? <laughs> so if you look at the whole concept I guess, of quiet firing, it comes from a place where you don't want to deal with the labor relations of actually putting someone in a performance um, improvement plan and going through the process of legally firing them. So the hopes is if you frustrate them enough, you diminish their workload, they will then see a toxic environment and of their own accord choose to then leave, which means you're not liable for a separation uh, package, you're not liable for having a conversation with the labor courts, they just simply disappear after being frustrated. Um, it's very, very rare that organizations, especially in large multinationals, can just simply fire someone without some repercussions from a labor perspective. Hmm, I see. That's interesting. So everyone is trying to avoid, because again, there are clauses when you're being employed. There are clauses where they put out, um, what's the word now? They put some clause to say, okay, if I'm the one firing you, X, Y, Z would happen. I would have to pay you some severance package. So I get, I get why it's happening, but, but... Vumi, does fire, uh, quiet firing, does it happen in multinationals? Because I feel like this quiet firing will be a lot more within one-man organization kind of structure. Does it happen amongst um, what's it called multinationals as well? It does. It happens across the board. So it, is, it seems more frequent with, uh, usually if it is a one-man show or small organizations, it's a case of it's awkward, we don't necessarily have the processes in place to get rid of you, so it's easier to then use quiet firing. With multinationals, we realize we've got enough pockets that if we went to labor courts, you most likely would leave. So everyone's calling it quiet firing now. If we would go back several years back, it would be known as constructive dismissal, where in essence we put things in place to make it easy for you to go, where we are manipulating um, our power as an employer, our power as a manager to help get you out of the business. So we're dismissing you through constructively creating an environment that doesn't serve you where you can quickly see I'm never going to get a promotion and as soon as I get another job, I'll be out. I'll be so frustrated that I'll be out. So from a one-man show, it might be a case of I just don't have the processes in place. From a large organization, I don't want to tap into... Oh, wow. We're having... Next. Besides, you, you find that um, you are you are going to experience quiet firing. It's not mutually exclusive, and it's not necessarily just for those multinationals or just for smaller operating companies. Hmm. Okay, let me call, let NJ come in. <laughs> um, my question would be: What do you do when you realize you're in that kind of situation? You find yourself in that kind of situation where you have a boss who is trying to frustrate you into quitting yourself you know how do you how do you handle the situation because sometimes i feel like it can get quite frustrating and you're not sure exactly what to do and i i know that when i did have that experience it was it was a ton in my flesh. I, sometimes you go home and you're just wondering and sometimes you have crying days where you just wonder how bad things can actually get and at what point you feel like you've had enough. So how do you how do you live through that situation and still be able to deliver on your because some for some people they just feel at that point, you know what? You know, I'm just going to do what I want to do since this guy wants to frustrate me. You know, it could go one way or the other. Some people quit. Some people just end up, you know, taking the com uh, trying to take the company down with them. Hmm. So how do you how do you deal? What's the best way to deal with such a situation? The first is to be as unemotional as possible. And what I mean by that is you need to be able to gather evidence. If you are experiencing fine firing or constructive dismissal, then in essence, most of the time, if you read your employment contract, is a breach of your employment contract. 
Okay, because that means that your employer has violated the implied duty of trust and confidence and is not acting on a Friday. So you want to make sure you don't necessarily quit immediately because then you lose all legal protection. However, the burden of proof lays with you. So you need to prove that constructive dismissal or quiet firing is actually in, in essence occurring. So I want you to keep a little file of in case of emergency where you are saving all the emails, where you are emailing to say, good day sir, I've noticed I wasn't invited to this meeting, however it does fall within my scope, is, the, is my job spec, has it changed? So you constantly are referring to the prior agreements that you are now being iced out of and you keep that correspondence until you are able to have enough of a body of proof that you can say, I feel like this might be constructive dismissal. Am I experiencing quite firing? And then that happens, what tends to happen, organizations tend to get a little bit scared because if this gets into the media, if this gets into the space of labor courts, you then have enough body of evidence to prove that this was intentional and no one wants that. So what I found with most of my clients with coaching is when this conversation happens, then they open themselves up to potential compensation claims, or then the discussion for mutual separation starts occurring. When they don't, they just leave. And when you just leave, it has a direct impact on your future employment. How are you going to be able to get a good reference from an organization that is trying to fire you and you quit, and you look like you're someone who job hops, as opposed to someone who, in essence, was intentionally um, um, dismissed through constructive dismissal or quiet firing. So what happens when you're able to negotiate that mutual separation agreement or something that's a little bit more amicable is uh, by virtue of that contract you have a non-disclosure agreement so they cannot say anything negative when asking for references. So the moment you quit, you quit on yourself and opportunities for potentially future employment. So I mean, Bovumi, what you've just said now, either way, right, is still a problem. Because if I'm expressing quiet firing and I'm able to then take it up with, um, what's it called, the labor law courts, right? Um, whether I like it or not, I will be blacklisted. So I, I tend to understand that it is difficult for people that are experiencing quiet, because a lot of people actually experience quiet firing here in Nigeria. A lot of people do that. But you see, they do not fight it because, again, they are afraid of what would happen if, I then take up this matter, you know, company, my, my company would blacklist me. And of course, it maybe it will be difficult to get a job because again, they'll say, ah, that person, she's just trouble. Don't ever employ her. They blacklist. I've yeah. seen, I mean, this one, this particular case, I've seen someone that complained to us that she was blacklisted, right? She was blacklisted. First of all, she was, there was a, a, a quiet firing that happened that forced her to resign, right? Then she resigns, then she was blacklisted. Now nobody wants to work with her, right? Because that person has said, this person can never work with me. She's this, she's that, and all of that. So regardless, there's still that fight that is happening. So how do we, how do we win the situation? Because it's not going to be easy. If I, fight, yeah. if I fight the organization, I lose. If I don't fight the organization, I still lose. Right, and, so, and what I was saying is, I didn't say take it to the labor courts. I mm. said build a case mm. that when you go to your organization and you say, in light of our contract, is this constructive dismissal? Mm. And what I found is most organizations, to avoid even having to go to the labor court, choose to settle out of court with you. And you're absolutely right. The moment you go to the labor courts or uh, here we call it CCMA, there is a chance that you, you know, industries are small. Everyone talks, whether it's the energy industry or it's the financial services industry. People will talk and say, mm, that person took the, the, organized, um, the organization to court and, and they won't necessarily give context with regards to that. And confidentiality isn't always respected in those spaces. But what we found is when you have a body of evidence and you now go to your manager and you have a conversation or you go to HR and you say, listen, I'd like to unpack this a little bit. I've had a conversation with my manager. This is what's happening. Here's the, 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 the proof, the burden of proof. What tends to happen then is that organizations seem to say, okay, let's settle. Hmm. So you're still able to retain your reputation, probably get a, what we've seen as an average of three to six months, and then you walk out. Hmm. However... It's not, I get it, it's not always an easy thing to go tell your manager, I can see you working me out of the system. 
I, I completely understand that. But when you are aware and you're going to get fired anyway and you're going to quit anyway, you might as well try and negotiate an exit package on your way out. Mm. You're going to quit anyway. The, the relationship has been tarnished to an extent that it's, 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 it's not able to reconcile. So if you've got those irreconcilable differences, think of it as a divorce. You might as get something out before you walk out with nothing at all. Mummy, you're, you're, you're speaking because, it, I mean, maybe where you are, they are kind of, uh, there's a bit of structure. There's a, there's a method to the madness where you are. Here, mm. there's no method to any madness. Because literally, and I'm, I'm speaking to you even, I'm not talking small businesses. Big mm. organizations that maybe off air, I can tell you their names. We've heard so many, so many very funny stories about how the employers treat their employees, right? And yet nothing gets done. So we, first of all, in Nigeria, we're fighting, we're battling a lot of things. Our labor laws are completely comatose. Like literally nobody fights for you, right? Then you go into organizations, right? Some are perceived to be structured, but they really do not have a structure, right? The ones that even have a structure, they have no basis to, um, to, to what's it called? To up uphold their own part of the agreement. So there are so many things that are scattered there. So in this kind of chaotic situation here in Nigeria, what would be the best counter for somebody that is going through quiet firing? In a space where you do not have the luxury of, of labor, for me, it then becomes a case of how do I salvage my reputation? Because in that space, specifically in any industry, and we all know Africa across the board is a connection economy. Mm. I would then salvage my reputation. And what I will try and do is if I'm aware of the fact that my direct manager is trying to work me out, who else in the organization can be a key influencer or key decision maker that I can add value to? Mm. Clearly, my workload here is now shifting. My direct manager no longer wants me to support. Mm. Who else? Can I potentially add value to that even on my way out when this man or this woman says, ah, she's useless. Someone else can come and say, she's not too bad. She was able to help with A, B, C, D. So for me, that becomes important. The second piece that becomes important is even on my way out, having the conversation around, what can I do to improve? Yes, you know you are giving your 110%. This person is clearly unsatisfied with that. And then asking specifically, what actions can I do to counter what is what we are currently experiencing from a performance perspective? If you're able to garner that information from your actual manager who's trying to get you out, you can quickly survey whether it's something that's even capable or something that's not capable. Hmm. And then even having the conversation and being bold enough to say, if I'm not serving you in this particular arena, is there another space in the business that potentially I can add more value? where perhaps my skill set or how you're experiencing me does not suffice. Because if someone, sometimes it's a personality clash, sometimes someone finds you intimidating, sometimes someone just simply doesn't like you. So if you're able to have that conversation and pivot the relationship where you're not having to deal with them in a one-to-one, -one, still retain your position within the organization and still add value elsewhere so that even when you leave, your biggest asset and commodity is your reputation. You mm. can keep that intact as much as possible. Mm. If this person in essence is a detractor, what you're trying to do is neutralize them. So they say nothing good and they say nothing bad. That way, even if you get another opportunity, they're not going to speak against you. Mm. So for me, in that position, that becomes my primary objective. Mm. Awesome, awesome. Fantastic. I like, I like how you broke it down. So let's go on a very short break, right? When we come back from that break, we'll continue this fantastic conversation. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. <laughs> now, if you just tune in, we're having an interesting conversation, as you can tell. We're discussing um, quiet firing. This is a very juicy topic, honestly. I think Vumi would have to do a lot of parts on this conversation and what it mm -hmm. means for employee, um, employees. Um, of course, we have with us Vumi. Um, she's joined us from South Africa. Now, please, let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join this conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 8 one eight zero three eight four six six three. All right, so Vumi, I mean, this is a very interesting conversation, like I said, right? Um, and I love the fact that you have said something. But I want to, I want to take you back to what you said. Because, so I, I did a course on, on, on um, product management. And 
just for the for for the sake of knowledge i wanted to also like i i i offered my services to be able to intern with a company mm -hmm. sadly when i was interning my direct supervisor was kind of like you know you know she went left and i knew mm -hmm. you know so i just you know so i had i had actually approached the company but maybe because they didn't take me seriously i told them i said okay you know what if product management is not working you know i'm also fantastic in the media space can i move to the corporate comms department so i can i can be of value there instead of this place where i am at and all of that they glossed over it and they didn't take it seriously at some point you know what i just say you know what i resign i don't do it again <laughs> you know but but I, i'm trying to explain to you that so what if you explore that option and you're not given that option what then do you do so often when you are exploring that option you're speaking to your direct manager who really is set again who's dead set against you so what becomes critical there is how do you go about lobbying for business mm. and lobbying for those opportunities so what i talk about is then who are the key influencers who are the key decision makers mm. how do you cultivate a relationship with them that even when you're going to the manager who's most likely going to say to you no i'm not going to be supporting you with regards to this that they realize that their power is greater and more influential than them who will back you so your ability to lobby one becomes important your ability to articulate how you can add value becomes important and then as i always say to my clients it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission hmm. what do i mean if you go out and you start saying listen i'm starting to give add value to the media team not necessarily with your boss's consent at the time but they seeing the value then say oh i've been volunteering with another department adding a little bit of value you know i, I think it, it, it adds value to the organization as a whole now your boss is going to have to say, oh, now I'm going to speak to another manager who's my peer to say why you can't add value when I'm not utilizing you already. Mm. So it becomes a strategic game where you are, one, lobbying at a senior level to get that back up at the peer level of your boss to add value so then they have to counter why you have to go. And then, of course, you're cultivating relationships across the board with people who are your peers as well, saying, what, what are you working on? Can I help? So it becomes a case of, Everybody, you know that show Everybody Loves Raymond. Everybody loves Bumi except you. You must be the problem. Mm, that's fantastic. I like that. It, no, it's a fantastic uh, <laughs> approach. I still feel it, it doesn't hit home mm. for me in terms of what we have, in terms of reality of what is really going on. You know, Uwa, you had mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of unstructured organizations even big organizations so a lot of all this um you know steps that you can take what now happens when is your the owner you know you you, you mentioned you're dealing with you're having an issue with the manager it, okay so key decision makers so you are you're having an issue with the manager and you want to go and meet the next person another key decision maker maybe your ceo or your boss what mm -hmm. do you do when is your boss who is, of the company is doing the I call it constructive founder, dismissal. Yeah, if it's the founder, if you're reporting directly to the CEO, if you just uh, reporting directly to the owner, yeah, they prescribe the culture and they prescribe who they who they hire. There's a good quote I, I heard that says the only person that gets to determine who they work with are founders, owners, and CEOs. Mm. It's the power they have. So if, it's, if that's the dynamic where it's the direct CEO, the direct chairperson, if the reality is that's going to be near impossible because they prescribe the culture, they prescribe who it is that walks through the door. And if they don't want you in the door, you don't fit their culture, they can, in essence, frustrate you out. And the ramifications are a lot harder because if the chairperson doesn't like you, who do you go to? Hmm. So I was going to say, so. The shareholder. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, so I was going to say to you that, so when you are in that situation, how do you manage, because this is the, the you are at the, the final table. table of the, yeah. what's it called, the highest decision maker, right? That's the, that is where the, the, the challenge is coming from, right? The quiet firing and all of that, the constructed firing, you know? So when you are with direct, directly working with the owner of the company, so how do you manage the relationship in such a way that even after you leave, you're able to probably get referrals, you're able to get a lot of things from that company, you know, knowing that this person doesn't want you, you know, so what do you do? What would be the steps towards you eventually exiting that company? Because you really can't do anything about it anymore. 
In that particular case, for me, when you're trying to really save and salvage your reputation, it becomes a case of having a conversation around what should I be doing currently to make it easier? So for me, having an honest conversation, and I've been in a position where I was reporting to a director and it was a similar thing where um, she had inherited me from another director and it, it was just a difficult relationship. So I sat it down and I said, listen, I think from a personality perspective, there's a misalignment here. But however, what can I do to make your life easier? Hmm. Because currently you're taking stuff off my table. Perhaps the way I'm doing it is not to your liking. My style, might not, my approach might not be how you would prefer it done. So in this tenure where we are still together, what can I do differently to make it easier? Hmm. And that question was like, oh, okay, actually I want to take over A, B, C, D, and I don't like how you do E, F, G. And I was like, okay. Then the question then became, in light of knowing the industry so well, where do you think I would be a better cultural fit? Hmm. Hmm. Then it became a case of actually, to be honest with you, I think you would do much better in the DRC or etc. I think that would work better for you. And that conversation helped alleviate her frustration with me because I, I acknowledged that it wasn't working. And then what it also did is it, we both started working together to exit me out of her of her geographical location. <laughs> So when we were both sitting with the CEO, we were both very happy to say, listen, Mumi deserves to be chief of operations there as opposed to being part of my team here. Because the work she was doing was great for my predecessor, but personality-wise, we don't align. Awesome. I like what you said from your geographical location. Yeah. So I have one more example. So this is a case of founder, but then brings in someone that is supposedly with experience and expertise, right? And the person then goes into the company and the person is structuring the company, helping because that person also took on the vision of the founder to say, you know what, I really, because I see this, pro, this play out a lot with um, um, uh, startups, especially, um, uh, yeah, especially fintech. I hear it's a lot toxic. I see there was a point where um, it trended on X, you know, the people were just calling out a lot of CEOs, startups, and all of that. So uh, that's why I say I really love this conversation because I believe it can help a lot of people. I've learned a lot. I've learned diplomacy. I've learned how to, you know, approach my, my employer from a perspective of how do I help you. So now this particular mm -hmm. case is this person is the expert. The employer just probably just got the funding and was able to set up the company, but the expertise for it, the employer doesn't really have that expertise and that's why they brought in this person to come and be the person that would like kind of like structure the organization based on the experience from other corporate organizations but it became it, it got to a point where the founder now became a bit more resentful because it seemed every member of staff would always go to this other person you know for advice for counsel okay what do we do what do we do so she felt a bit small you know, in the place where this other person was. So how do you address both the person, the employee, and the founder in this instance, where the founder feels threatened that you are the expert, but, you know, it's like you're making me feel irrelevant in my own organization? I think that's bound to happen specifically in startups, right? Yes. When you're the founder, they say your, your company is like your firstborn. And all of a sudden, someone comes through and knows more than you. The favorite teacher or the amazing nanny, in essence, starts, uh, that phenomenon starts to happen. What, what is required for a great leader is to know when to transition. As a founder, you can only take your organization so far. Very few founders have the ability to continue to operate. And a lot of us take this for granted. It's the reason Steve Jobs got fired from, um, from, uh, from Apple. It's the reason even Jeff Bezos, they had to have a vote about whether he should continue as CEO, even though he'd been one of the founders. So this is a very, very normal thing. The feeling of intimidation, the feeling of insecurity, as someone else starts to take your vision and run it, and in essence, help you scale it. Because the skill set required from starting versus the skill set required from structuring and scaling is fundamentally different. Sure. So that insecurity is there. For me, it's a case of how do we put on our big girl, our big girl uh, pants, our big boy pants to be able to, to maneuver. When that does happen, the question then becomes, what is my value? What do I bring to the table? 
So it is a case where for me, I found a lot of founders, and I actually had a conversation with one um, last week, where he was saying, I don't know what my title is anymore. Because it seems like when you, everyone used to come to me, now no one comes to me. Yet I'm still the MD. Mm. And it's what I wanted when I created the business, but it hurts now that it's actually happening. Mm. I think very few people have that uh, emotional maturity to be able to articulate that. But also if you are the person coming in to help scale, Often you're the consultant, and if you are hired full-time, you then have to realize that you're dealing with not just the fragility of ego, but some of the fragility of someone's dream. Mm. So your sensitivity to how do you navigate that becomes very, very important. I think that speaks to what we often forget. When we go to work, we think it's all about the IQ, being the smartest person in the room, not realizing we're dealing with human beings, and that EQ becomes so, so important to help support that to take our organizations to the next level. How do you go about uh, navigating both? For me, taps into what do we know to be the biggest desire of the founder? Hmm. Steve Jobs, if people were able to articulate, and I think that's one of the reasons he came back, was the articulation of the fact that we want to make your dream bigger. We want to support you in it. And that made it create the culture where both could meet each other and it could be a happy marriage. Mm. Often when we're not articulating that I'm actually here to support you, but we start looking like we want to be the star striker, then the dynamics and the, and the politics get into a place that becomes very toxic and very healthy all around. Hmm. Hmm. This is really deep. <laughs> Very deep. This is some some business. I mean, we should be paying you for these business classes. <laughs> in dollars. In dollars. <laughs> <for me. laughs> Go ahead. It's it's a, it's quite a lot of information for me sharing here. But I wanted to take it. So I know we've been talking about like from the employee point of view. But um, most of the time, eventually, we end up uh, finding ourselves as CEOs and those managers that sometimes actually orchestrate those <laughs> actions so from the boss or from the manager point of view what are because sometimes i feel like sometimes they don't they don't know all the time do you uh I mean, do you think that they know all the time when they actually do this can this be done subconsciously hmm. question yes Definitely. So, it can definitely be done from a place of pure frustration. Okay. And often we see that happening when we've got young talents in the organization, where the, the energy required to train up skill is so exhausting that you find yourself just, let me, let me rather do it, or pass it to someone with experience. Mm. So the person who joined your organization to add value, to grow and to learn as an intern, as a graduate, as perhaps someone who's new in the industry, you end up not giving them that opportunity because you simply don't have the capacity. Mm. So it does occur. Where from a from a from a strategic perspective, it seems easier to keep the status quo as opposed to um, rope in somebody new into the team. And it does happen at times subconsciously. Hmm. So what 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 do you do? How do you um, what's how, how do you bring it to your consciousness? Yeah, how do you bring it to your consciousness yes. so that you're aware of what you're doing? And, and I probably just avoid that kind of um, yeah. behavior. So I think it becomes important in reviewing your team's work. So if you're seeing someone's work that, oh, I allocated this to person, I gave this to Fumi, but now I, I took it back and I gave it to Fumi. I must now say, why, why are you reporting back on nothing? Oh no, but you gave it to, oh no, but you gave it to, then I think you then, as a leader, have to take accountability and say, why am I doing that? And then have a skip skills gap analysis to say, I think you might not have, not have the capacity, so can you actually buddy up with a person who's an expert in this field and put together a clear um, knowledge transfer plan to allow you to be able to not be frustrated and allow yourself to just worry about productivity and capacity with, without realizing the human capital element, which is in essence firing quietly that person. Hmm. I was just going to say that, Vumi, just hearing you speak, right, I'm trying to process it to a bigger picture around governance, right, especially around the African continent, where you see leaders unable to have fantastic successors amongst their, their vice, you know, um, because again, I don't know what the problem is, because I, I feel like it's a big problem amongst, lead, amongst leaders in the entire leadership structure. Um, you see a governor, for instance, is unable to delegate or give things to his vice. 
uh, or deputy governor, or the president is unable to give things to his vice president, you know, to delegate. It's, it's, is this an African problem, you know, and, or I see it as an African problem. Let me, let me rephrase that. And how do we begin to um, consciously, because a lot of people in those deputy positions, vice positions, they've actually been fired a long time ago because literally they are just like figureheads, you know, not doing anything, but they're just there with a title, but very relegated to doing nothing. And I see this happen amongst our governance structure. So how do we solve that problem? How do we get them to become conscious of this and deliberately now start to uh, probably um, get better work relationship with their team members? That's a great observation. And in essence, that culture of having a key man dependency, which results in sometimes a lack of succession planning, mm. the only way to counter it is systems. So what we've seen, like even if you're looking from a political perspective on the continent, often we've got, you know, brilliant leaders, I'm sure you can see some of them in uh, behind me, um, who on the continent came up with great philosophies, great ideas, but some of their policies and their passion and their ability to get things done died with them because we simply do not put structures in place. And I think the difference between, even from a leadership perspective, what we've seen in, in other countries and in other continents versus us is the ability to put structures in place, which makes it impossible for knowledge transfer to not occur, mm. which makes it impossible for the succession of the organization as opposed to the individual to, to not occur. And we've seen this, right? We see this, we see this with um with Lee Kuan Yu in um in Singapore, where he built an incredible country, but the, the next thing he built was systems to ensure that even whether he's whether he's prime minister or not, that that succession continues. Mm. And we've seen this with great organizations. We've seen it with Apple. Everyone thought Apple would crumble without Steve Jobs. Enter Tim Cook, enough structures were put in place that it made it impossible for him to fail, but also he was a great leader so he could then thrive. So the question then becomes, whether it is in business or whether it is in politics, are we interested in being the stars of the show or are we interested in creating structures Systems. that will live and echo into eternity long past we, us being there? And I think that's the question. Often when we are put in positions of power, we have what we call a being power drunk, where it feels so good to be needed that we don't realize that the true test of leadership is the ability to lead other leaders. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very great question as to how do we put that in place that are we quietly firing the people that that should in essence be our torchbearers long after we're gone. And what sort of organizations are we building? Or are we just interested in being the stars of the show, having all the power, having all the knowledge, the institutional knowledge, having all the decision making without realizing that if something were to happen to us, even our family start um, organizations will completely flounder without us. Hmm. Oh my God. <laughs> We are having so much fun and we're running out of time. But if you have something final to say to anyone, so let's speak to, let's speak to two people now. Let's speak to the employee that has observed that he's been or she's been, uh, she's been relegated to a, a, a side. What would you advise her immediate actions would be? And to the employer, all the managers, right? Um, so there's the, the, the top, 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 and there's also the direct managers. What would you say to them? Mm -hmm. To the employee, have an honest conversation. Are you being quietly fired? Do you have a body of proof of evidence of this? Can you influence other people to lobby the organization to have your back and where you can actually be deployed into another space? And remember that having that direct conversation with your, with your employer does not mean that they're going to say, yes, of course, go somewhere else. They might just want you out. Mm. What is your personal strategy to get out or to be deployed elsewhere? Mm. You need to drive this yourself. Sitting in the corner and being frustrated serves no one. What's your game plan? The second is if you are an employer and you are in the space where you're realizing that you're quietly firing, this is a test of your leadership. Not everyone you lead will be your favorite person. And if this person is it's a culture clash, can you have the presence of mind to say, everyone adds value, where can I deploy them to? Or if they're not the right culture, culture fit, do I know someone where perhaps they could be the right cultural fit? I'm yet to meet someone who adds zero value 100% of the time. Mm. So I think it's important for us to know sometimes 
mm, it's not going to work. It might not be your cup of tea. You might be someone, you know, is like, this is not for me. But this not being for me does not necessarily mean we have to blacklist people, we have to badmouth people. Everything that comes out of our mouth is a reflection on us. And always remember, whoever you're stamping on, on your way up, you might just meet on your way down. Absolutely. That's a, that's a fantastic way to wrap it up. Bumi, we missed you, by the way. <laughs> so we're happy that we're back. <laughs> It's we're going to be back. I'm telling you, so we're going to do this more. Thank you so much, Bumi, for your Thank time. Thank you. I mean, interesting. Yes. I'm telling you, yes, anyway, my body does a sweet thing. Yeah. <laughs> I love. I say I love this topic. You, you didn't understand why. I, I get it, it. It cuts across a lot of yeah. things. Thank you yeah. so much, Bumi. Now, thank you, NJ. Before we go, I hope you had fun like us. Sorry, we couldn't take your messages today. We had technical <laughs> issues. <laughs> Um, remember you can join, uh, interact with us further, drop your comments, most importantly follow all our engagements on social media, like, share and invite your families and friends. Please don't watch it alone, don't be selfish, share, share the links, right? Um, so if you missed our quote for today, here it is again, it says, quiet quitting is unfair to co-workers who may feel pressured to pick up your slack. And if your behavior truly is in response to your employer trying to push you out the door, it seems like actively disengaging would only perpetuate a no-win situation. I mean, Vumi has given so many fantastic um, nuggets. If you are, if you listened in, you know, if you know anybody going through this, share this link to this person. There are fantastic strategies that she has put in in this short time so that you can actually deploy and get, you know, yourself. At a better level thank you so much we'll see you guys on monday at 8 p.m as we bring another great conversation to your screen